Well, this is a series of photos hanging up in my building where I keep my cars. And um, this is my grandfather, who I was named after in 1940, uh, 160. And then this is my dad, who served in World War II with my grandfather when he went to visit on the base. He served over in uh, Germany during World War II. And then my grandpa was involved in politics in Chicago, so you can see he's campaigning with us. 1940. This is a 1937, and I had to study these over close to figure out what model of year. This is a 120. I could tell by the shape of the windows, the door handles. This is my grandfather, Charlie Lockman, my grandmother, Agnes Lockman, and that's a picture of my dad when he was probably about 12 years old, sitting in the front seat with his parents of this 1937 pack. So that's kind of, you know, through the years I grew up as a child, I would come across these old photos, and it was my dream, and one of the first in my collection was the 1940-160. Well, these are the uh, original startup brothers of Packer, James Packer and William Packer, and some of you are, might be familiar with how they got started in the car industry. They actually came from a prominent family in Warren, Ohio that owned a number of businesses. One of the businesses was starting the Packer uh, Lighting Company, Electric Company, which later, uh, eventually, and it's still around today, as uh, Delco, okay? And what they did was they purchased a Winton automobile around 1898, and the automobile was lacking endurance for, for James Packer, who uh, took that a number of trips, kept breaking down, and he would go back to the owner of the company, Mr. Winton, and he would make suggestions on how he could improve his automobile. And uh, Winton, after a few suggestions, said to him, if you think you could do a better job, why don't you start your own company? And that's what they did. So in 1899, they started along with George Weiss, the, their first automobile company, which was called the Ohio Automobile Company in 1899. So prior to 1902, they were called the Ohio Automobile. And then that was changed to the Packard Automobile Company in 1902. Next in line was, uh, was Henry Joy with investors. Uh, he became president in 1909 and he became chairman in 1916. Probably one of the most noted Packard executives who was with the company, as you can see, for over 25 years was James McCauley. And he was instrumental with bringing a lot of innovation to Packard, uh, the introduction of the 120 and so forth. And then one of the later ones was uh, Harold Churchill. He became president in 1956 and he was instrumental uh, with uh, the, the takeover of Studebaker coming about, moving the plant to South Bend. Interesting is uh, Harold Churchill actually grew up not too far from here in the uh, Dwajak Cassopolis area and still has relatives over there in that uh, area. I thought it would be interesting to see a list of the Packard engines in the years that they were produced. So if we take a look at their first engine in 1899, 1901, it was a one-cylinder engine. And then 1902 to 1912, they brought in a four-cylinder straight, straight four-cylinder engine. From 1912 to 1915, they brought in a six-cylinder straight engine. 1916 to 1923, the, uh, what they refer to as the twin six, 12 cylinder, and actually the way this came about is interesting, where they took like two six cylinder engines and joined them together to make it 12. Very interesting. 1921 to 28, they came out with a single six again, and then 23 to 24, they had the eight cylinder. Now notice in 24, they stopped with that until 27, so they went a few years without the eight cylinder, and that's where the six cylinder picked up. 1932, they brought the twin six back, as they called it, for that one year. And then 33 to 39, they referred to it as the 12. 
that was 12 cylinders. And then in 1937 to 1949, the six cylinders or the straight six. I'll show you a photo here in a few minutes, the 37115C, which was a very popular car. They sold uh, thousands of those. Uh, and then the 1955 was the first year of the V8, and they used that in their automobiles like the Hawk and the Hardtop until they stopped building automobiles in uh, 1958. Now, what's interesting with Packard is their plant virtually made just about everything for their automobiles, from the engines to the interior to and, and accessories. They didn't farm stuff out. They did do what other automobile companies might do, and that was have some custom body cars, like Dietrich and so forth, but just about all the bodies and workmanship, chassis, engines, was all done at their factory. So they were a hands-on operation. This is a picture of James Packard on the first Packard, and uh, you can see he probably didn't baby this car. The, the wheels had mud on them and so forth, maybe after the rainy day there in Ohio. And then this is on exhibit, that's the same car. And um, the first original Packard is on display at Le Lehigh University in Ohio. Uh, interesting enough, that's where James Packard went to um, a school for uh, design and uh, for learning how to do uh, mechanical things as well as uh, Henry Joy, so they had those things in common. This is kind of Packard's motif, if you will. They refer to that as the yoke. And they started using that design on their radiator shapes uh, in the summer, like around the late, uh, early teens, maybe around 1908, 1909. Uh, this is a Packard uh, paperweight made out of brass, and so I thought it would be interesting to show uh, that design. This is somewhere like around 1911, 1912 uh, automobile there. And then I brought in a series of, of slides to just show the transformation of the Packard through the years. And we could see, you know, in the early years they referred to them as uh, horseless carriages. And you could see by the design of this, how oh, that's kind of a carriage how tall it is. This is somewhere around 1910. And uh, we could see the wheels here. They had the, uh, the hexagon in the center of them later on. And we could see how this started to turn out. A lot of people are traveling. They, they have a, a wicker basket here for picnics and so forth. Also notice the brass. And here we see the, the yoke. And this one was uh, had the crank on the front. This is an early 20s Packard, and uh, we see the double suicide doors, and also we see the yoke grill. Notice that there is no front bumper on this automobile. Uh, they didn't come out with uh, front rear bumpers for a little while after this, but they do have other things on it, like the, the light here on the cowl, and uh, this one in particular has the double suicide doors and the wooden uh, spoke wheels. Just to see how they change through the years, notice the beautiful colors, this two-tone uh, blue with all the Packard accessories. We have the mirrors here and uh, mounted onto the side mounts, the, the bumpers, we have fog lights, we have fender lights, we have the horn. Uh, this is a stone guard on the front of the radiator grill. Uh, this was what's referred to as the goddess of speed, the deluxe uh, hood ornament, which I'll explain a little bit more detail here in a little bit. We also have a spotlight here, what they refer to as wingdings on this uh, convertible. The, the step plate, it, this is just loaded. This I thought was interesting. This is Carl Lindbergh's 1929 Packard. And uh, you can see the, the different details to this, the hub wheels again, the hexagon uh, hub. What's interesting about these hubs is they look the same, but there was like 30 different sizes and sizes of threads. So if you didn't know any better, and you had to order one of these for your package, you better make sure that you have the right model here 
because chances are it might not fit because they had these various sizes. Uh, this is a 1930, and we can see in this photo again the uh, goddess of speed. They have the bumpers on here, the, the bumper guards. You might recognize this famous celebrity. This is Clark Gable. And here he is with his early 30s Packers that is all deluxe out. We see these special wheel hubs on here that were accessory. The chrome work, this bumper. This was such a massive automobile that this area in here were shocks, loaded shocks in to help balance the bumper because the automobile was so massive. We see the uh, fender lights here. There were a number of celebrities that have owned Packers through the year, Al Jolson, uh, politicians, senators. You see lots of pictures of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt riding in a Packer uh, uh, parade car. Herbert Hoover was the first president to be seen riding in an automobile, and uh, that was a Packer. You might recognize this lady wonderful lady that passed away a few years ago. Her name was Margaret Dunning. She lived to be 104. This is her 1930 Packard Roadster that is actually on display here at Neil Morris. Up until the day she passed away, she drove that car herself to meets, and she also changed the oil in it herself and did the service work at 104. I got to talk to her caretaker after she passed away and I was blessed. He gave me a set of four tires from this car that she had taken off and replaced at some point. She was personal friends with both Harvey Firestone and Henry Ford. She was from Plymouth, Michigan. And she actually ordered those tires new. That was back in the day when you could call the factory owner. And so I'm blessed to have a set of tires from this automobile that she personally put the order in with Harvey Firestone himself. This is an example of one of Packard's custom body cars. It is a 1931 water house. And what makes this unusual is this back here, this dip back here, that's one of water house's signature. Again, the chrome dish wheels just loaded out. The beautiful colors, the two-tone. We see the double side mounts on the rear which kind of helps uh, exemplify the, the length of this car. Uh, again, loaded out chrome. Uh, we see a special hood ornament called uh, the Sliding Boy, which wasn't used on a lot of cars, but that was one of Packard's uh, hood ornaments which they chose to use. This is a 1932-900, often referred to as a light eight, often referred to as a shovel nose because the grill of this goes like this, like a snow shovel. And uh, this car was one of their lower price models, but even though it was low price, it still had the larger engine in it for 1932, plus all the deluxe ornaments that went with it. And this car would really go down the road because it was lighter than the other 32s, but still had the uh, large engine in it. I took this slide because I thought, even though this is a 1934 Packard Dash, it is a work of art if you study it. This is the glove box. This is where you would turn the key on to, to uh, start the car. But we see here, this is a cat's eye lighter and the gauges all matching. This is actually adjustment for ride. You could just turn this dial and adjust how you wanted the car to ride. This is an accessory radio, and you would use the key to turn the radio on. And uh, I thought this was just spectacular. The workmanship, the wood, and uh, that was Packard all the way. This is a 1936 Packard. This was the last year for the double suicide doors. This is a 120, which they introduced in uh, 1935. There is some controversy over that. I happen to believe that that's what helped save the company. 
for another 20 years. Some folks will say, well, that might have diluted the Packard image because they took and uh, uh, made a smaller car out of a smaller engine. But even though they did that, they still used the same craftsmanship in that car. So they didn't chintz on any of the any of the workmanship. And also they sold tens of thousands of these from like 1935 to 1940. So I happen to believe had they not made that move, uh, they might have been one of the car companies that might not have made it through the Depression. This is a 1937 120C, and so this is the model after the one that I just showed you, and we see some slight changes here. The hubcaps a little bit different, but uh, we can see if, if you look at the what we call the senior cars, which would be the larger engine cars. Uh, versus this junior car, it still has the same ornaments, the same quality of workmanship. The difference is the middle class driver could afford this car. It was much less in price than the other senior cars, but they didn't give up any quality. This is another 1937. This is a 115C. This is the straight six cylinder car. And uh, this is kind of unique because it's a, it's a two-door sedan instead of a four-door. But you can see the only really changes in this other than it's a shorter wheelbase car and a smaller engine of straight six versus a straight eight, just a minor subtle change. The uh, bumper guards are a little bit different. And it's interesting that on this car versus the 37-120, the engine uh, vents here were all chrome on the prior slide, and this one is just on the front. But same quality workmanship, and just an outstanding automobile. This is a gentleman with his 1940 160, and uh, the reason why I put this one on here is uh, this car actually has air conditioning in it. I couldn't uh, come up with a picture that would do it justice to show Packard's uh, air conditioning. This was the first year Packard had an air conditioner in the car and also the first year that an automobile company would uh, put a, a freestanding air conditioner in one of their automobiles. This is a 1940 Packard Baron. Uh, this was designed by Dutch Baron. And you can see the differences here with the sloping uh, door. It's a convertible, some more sedans. Most of them were two doors. There were some that were also uh, four door sedans. Just a beautiful automobile. They didn't make a lot of them. We could see the Packard yoke grill continues on. The massive bumper guard and the accessory license plate bracket. This is a 1941. Uh, this is their new model. And the difference here is this is the first year that they built the headlights into the fenders. Also, we see some change here in lifting up the hood. This actually is a, a pull-out lever that pulls out. And also the cap whiskers, but I refer to these as cap whiskers. The first year for that, uh, they put these on the side of the car to add a little pizzazz to them. Notice the yoke grill as well. And also, this car does not have um, you could get it with or without running boards. This particular one did not have running boards, so when you stepped out of the car, you were right there. And then we can see the prices range of $907 to $55.50. And they continued on with this model car uh, for another year, and they made them in all different size engines, six cylinder, eight cylinder. This is a 1941 Clipper. This was the first year that they made some massive changes. They still had the one from the previous slide, but notice how the car is sleeker in here. The fender still sticks out a little bit. They have these uh, uh, guards going this way. Still, we see the yoke in the grill here. And some cars even brought the cat whiskers out here, it just depends. These cars, uh, none of them had um, uh, step plates to get in, they didn't have running for 
So this car didn't come with running boards, no matter what way you work it. Some of them had fender skirts. Uh, this was the first year for a new type dish uh, hubcap. The, this car had a radio in it, so the antenna is here instead of on the fender. Uh, quite a piece of work. It had a, a knob in there, and from that one knob, you could adjust the antenna up or down, or tip it whatever way you want. Uh, ingenuity at its greatest. This is a 1949, often referred to, as you can probably tell, as a bathtub model because they didn't have a lot of lines in it. And uh, but yeah, we can still see the Packard Yoke grill here. This is a Super. Uh, they also have a Custom that has a beautiful, many, many pieces to the grill in it. That's the difference there. But you can see how they still continue to maintain quality with their automobiles even into the late 40s. Uh, this is a Packard Woody, obviously, from the wood panels on the doors. And we can see here we've got massive bumper guards on this that were an accessory as well. This is a 52, and we can see the 50s start to be integrated into some of their ornaments. I refer to these as uh, bottle cap openers because they were kind of shaped like that. They put four there. The feather skirts. We continue to see the yoke here, a little bit different style of yoke, but still you can tell that. Also, it's interesting, uh, prior to this, Packard put a spear type design on their hoods. And we continue to see that spear like design even on the side of this early 50s car. And here we see a 53 where they have a subtle change with some of the uh, stainless trim here. Packard did make some commercial cars. They made hearses, they made taxis, and this is an example of their ambulance. Packard worked with another company on the chassis of this car called Henny. Uh, Packard practically owned Henny because they gave him so much business. Henny was out of uh, Freeport, Illinois, and they did a lot of the chassis for the cars like the limousines and so forth, and, and this car. And again, you see the yoke in the front here, and they also made uh, Air Force ambulances, two and four doors. I chose this slide because look at the difference in the instrument panel dashboard on this 53 Packard versus the 34. Very simplified, very modernized. You see the clock here. It only has these three, and they started to bring the gauges into one here, the lights for the battery, the turn signals, and the odometer. So a uh, big change in the course of 20 years over what dashboards look like. This is a 1955 Clipper. This isn't the same Clipper that they introduced in 41. Uh, that edition stopped in 47. And then they renamed uh, part of the company, uh, an associate company of theirs, Clipper. It was still made by Packard, they carried the Clipper name. And I don't know if you can see it, but here we see like a shift's wheel that was kind of the motif of that. So 55, we could start to see the 50s coming in. The two tone and the lights and the feather skirts again and the molding on the side. So, here again, even though it was an associate company of Packard, it still had uh, the same workmanship. Also, I'll discuss uh, this a little bit up later. The 55 was the first year for the V8 engine, so that would have been new to this model car. This is a 56 Clipper. We can see the design change in the rear uh, tail lights here, starting to get a little fit effect here. On. Interesting enough, this is Packard's uh, 57 Predator. This car, they only made one of them, it didn't go into production, it was designed by Dick T, who did a lot of the Packard design work. This automobile is on display at the Studebaker Museum in South Bend. And uh, you can see, you know, the space age stuff was starting to take place with the tail lights and, 
And this was kind of a form of a T-top, it kind of slid over and so forth. This is the world-renowned Caribbean tricolor, the wire wheels. Here again, we see their design uh, in the grill. And uh, interesting with this model car is the seats, you can turn the seats over and get a different color and different form of material uh, on the seats. So that was kind of interesting. And we see this had a powerful engine, so we see a couple uh, foot scoops here. This was the last year of the Packard. Uh, this is a two-door hardtop. They didn't make a lot of them, they made 675. Also, this is the year of the Packard Hawk. I chose this one because you don't see a lot of these two-door car tops. This was often referred to as a fish mouth front end. You can kind of see the way that, that kind of turns out here with that. We see the Packard letters there, the uh, quad headlights, and the hood scoop. And you can't really tell in this picture, but they actually had a set of double fins on the back. Uh, Dick Teague also designed this car. And I kind of think that he thought, well, if one set of fins is good, then two ought to be even better. And so he put uh, another set of fins on the back of this car. Next, we're going to take a look at Packard badges. Uh, these are the early Packard badges here. And uh, going back to the early 1900s, early 1920s. They started with this showing, this is the Packard coat of arms, uh, in honor of James Packard after he passed away around 1928. And we could see there weren't really any major changes with this. They would put these on uh, like the front of the car, around the radiator, they would put them on just a whole bunch of different things like trunks and so forth. Uh, they would identify the different models, the different engines in addition to that. These are also other medallions. Um, these on the right, Again, the ones that they might use on the front of the car, they might uh, use these on the uh, uh, hubcaps. This is an early uh, 1900s Packard. You can tell by this grill here, one from the twin six. This is from the mid 1920s. Uh, this one from the early 40s. And these are exceptional in the fact that these, a lot of these were poisoning. So very elegant looking. Next, we're going to take a look at the different types, and I picked the three most popular types of foot ornaments. Uh, this again is the goddess of speed, often referred to as the donut or the wheel chaser because of this. And we can see the wings here. Uh, this is from uh, early 20s Packard, also this one. These were functional in that these were actual radiator caps, so we lifted them off of the automobile. That's how you put a in the radiator. This one is from a 1937. This is just an ornament. You did not check the antifreeze through this. You had to lift up the, the side of the hood, but it looked like a radiator cap. This also was one that you could be lifted off, probably off of a 36, somewhere around there. Uh, this is off from one that's all part of this, like this. And so that's another one that uh, wasn't functional, was just there for design. This is around 1925. They implemented the, the uh, Goddess of Speed with the other, uh, this is actually a thermostat for the car. And so they implemented it with that. That's what's referred to as a motor meter. Here we see a different version of that. This is from around 1930. Uh, late 1920s, so we could see how the design had changed. Uh, later on, they made the wings out of glass, which added to the beauty. This is the cormorant, often referred to as the swat. And uh, here again, this is a functional one. This one is, this one is, this one is not, because it mounted on the top of the hood. Uh, this is most likely from uh, 41 or 42. This is very interesting. This is actually an antenna. So this serves as not only an ornament, 
but this is to help get the signal from the antenna. These are very, very rare. And once in a while you'll see one on a meat on like either a 40 or a 41 or 42 that would be able to house that uh, type of a photo in that. These are ones that were pretty much uh, not quite as flashy, but still very elegant. This is referred to as a bale. And even though it had this, what appeared to be functional, it was for ornament. Uh, some of the earlier ones, earlier bales, you could check the hanging trees with that, but this one was not functional, it was strictly for style. Here we see a couple more. Uh, this is another type of a style, like a bullet. This is from a, uh, probably around the 40, uh, 41 here, another 41. And then these go into the 50s, kind of the aerodynamic age. This is interesting. This was on their anniversary year only. So this would have came off of a, of a 50 packer. And this had glass piece that uh, circular that went in there. I thought this was kind of interesting. This was General MacArthur's Packer. This is a 1942 Clipper. And General MacArthur ordered this from Packer direct from the factory with all the accessories on it. It was loaded. It had air conditioning. It was a longer wheelbase car. It had the straight eight engine in it. We could see his pipe here. We could see his gun here. This had, um, special windows on it, bulletproof uh, windows. This car has come up for sale a number of times. I actually got to talk to uh, two of the owners of this automobile. The last I found it was in Dallas, Texas. But this is one of the reasons why I like Packard. They were a big part of the company. This car was $2,600 in 1942, which was a tiny sum of money. General MacArthur sent Packard a check for $2,600. Packard returned the check back to the general saying it is a gift from us and would not accept any money for it. Another one I can remember was, uh, and I have this on display in my shop, is uh, Macaulay, going back to Macaulay, one of the past presidents, he actually took the time during the Depression to write a letter to the Boy Scouts uh, answering the letter that they had sent him. Actually took the time out to do that. We can also see the blackout. You don't see any chrome on this car, so it doesn't shine to the enemy. And uh, just a fantastic automobile. Uh, Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower, General Eisenhower also had a Packard Clipper 42. Uh, being that they ceased production, the U.S. car company ceased production around February of 1942 and did not start up again until 46. Um, Packard helped in the war effort, and what cars they did produce went to the military, and they switched over to airplane uh, engines and marine engines to help fight the war and buy the equipment. A lot of people don't realize that Packard made a series of trucks from 1917 to 1923, and here we see some of the interesting body uh, types with these. Uh, these are all hard rubber tires, so they probably provided uh, quite a ride. Every once in a while, you'll see one in the museum uh, or a collector might have one. These are just massive trucks. They made race engine bolts. Here we see a twin engine bolt for Packard engines. I chose this one because it exemplifies the, uh, the Packard workmanship and, and the artwork in their this is for a 1929 Packard, and you can see how the color ad, this probably came out of National Geographic or one of those magazines, and you can see how they integrated very elegant and rich color uh, into their graphics, and we can see, as the man who owns one, they continue to use that in their ads. Kind of an interesting story, uh, this is President Gilliam, President of Packard. He didn't serve as president for very long. Uh, 1941. And this picture also shows a 41 Packard cab. Just to show you how ethics have changed. Uh, Gilliam was uh, in a car accident. 
uh, with a married woman that wasn't his wife. And he was in the hospital, and Packer sent somebody to the hospital in essence to tell him, you will resign immediately. They didn't want to be disgraced by that, and uh, he did resign. Uh, far contrast from what you see today with, uh, with what happens. This is a Packard army truck, and we can see the canopy and then the flag behind that. So this was an early uh, military vehicle that uh, Packard produced. This is uh, in 1942 in the Packard factory, and these are the executives and workers standing around the Packard. The last one to come off the line, the 1942 Clipper, and uh, this is a two-tone, we can tell by the, by the hood coming down here and then the top. And so they were all in for the war effort. And I thought that was uh, interesting. This is the assembly line, 1950 Packers. We can see the fellows there. And, and uh, it's interesting also to see how they're dressed. And not only this lady, but also even in the 20s, the workers dressed like they were going to the office. A lot of them wore white shirts, ties. You can see this fellow has suspenders on, and uh, just interesting. This is uh, from one of their ads, and this goes from 1899, which was this model here, to 1950, and this celebrated the Packer Jubilee, the 50 years of Packer being in business. And I chose this one because you can see how they changed over the years in these pictures. And then as this would be carried out after 1950 out to here, uh, we would see even more drastic changes with uh, fender skirts and, and uh, ornaments on the cars. And the... Packard was very good at rewarding their employees for service. This is an example. This is a 14 karat gold pocket watch, and we can see the Packard grill on here, ask the man who owns one ribbon, high quality Hamilton movement. They did these in wristwatches as well, and I thought this was interesting. This was the employee, and they gave him this watch for serving 10 years of service. So you know, you're a 20, 25, and 30, but they were so good to their employees, they actually awarded this one uh, for 10 years of service. This was one of their first race cars. I could build a number of race cars. One of them is here at Gilmore's uh, 1916 race car. Uh, this is a modern race car, but they still kept some of the Packard uh, ideas there. This is a, a suit that one from me. I thought this was interesting. Uh, this is a famous modified car. They kept the uh, grill design and the hubcaps, but the rest of the cars pretty well been modified. This has been a number of trade magazines. Well, these are just some of Packard's first. Uh, I took some of them that would, you know, we would recognize, but the list just goes on and on and on. The first air conditioned car, as I mentioned before, 1940. The first thermostat controlled the water circulation, the H gear shifting pattern, the first automobile with a steering wheel. Well, what did they use before a steering steering wheel? They called it a tether, which was similar to like a wagon wheel. You would just steer it like this. Well, how did Packard come up with a steering wheel? Well, James Packard was riding in one of his first Packards one day and hit a bump, and that jilted the tire was jilted that, that tether into him. He said, there's got to be something better than this, something that doesn't do that when you hit a bump. And he came out with the first steering wheel. A accelerator pedal that's connected to a hand throttle. Interchangeable wheel hubs. They had the first pack for rear luggage racks. The first straight L head engine. First 24 cylinder engine. We hear about uh, V16s and so forth. They had the first 24 cylinder engine. First 1,000 horsepower aircraft engine. They're famous for the Marlin engine. Uh, they sold a lot of those to Rolls Royce from during World War II. The first engine in the form of an S. 
the eight-cylinder engine with nine main bearings. Uh, most of these, a lot of these, were the 356 cubic inch engine. That was Packard's pride and joy. And uh, just an un unbelievable workmanship in that engine. The first diesel aircraft engine. Ride control. We can appreciate this, right? The first automobile was sun visors. First electronic overdrive. First to have front and rear bumpers as standard. And then the first to have aluminum pistons to help in performance and save weight. And like I mentioned, there are many, many more besides this, but I just picked these out because I thought these would be most of them that we could recognize. And then this is my son again enjoying a day at the Gilmore's and um, having a good time. Well, next we're going to venture out to the area where the cars are, and I'm going to pick up one of these cars and just point other things out with it before we close for today. Sorry. We're doing a switch here. there. Alright. Okay. Well, as you can tell, we're out in the main gallery here at the Gilmore, and you can also tell that we're getting ready for an exciting new exhibit all devoted to Packard. So Chuck, go ahead and tell us about this one. I know we probably won't pick up much microphone out here, but I'll be close enough so that I can uh, hear your voice, I think. Okay, Fred. This is a 1940 Packard model 180. This actually belonged to Norm Knight, who was with the Gilmore Car Museum many years ago. And I chose this car because it illustrates the 356, I don't know if this is light enough, engine in this car. Just a massive engine, uh, well equipped, 356, um, just a great piece. Really sent it down the road. In addition to that, we can see the deluxe medallion. This is Cloisonne and the ornament that goes across here, which uh, functions as a vent. Uh, Packard even printed the Packard uh, uh, script and the uh, mirrors, which were accessory. They had the bullet lights, the bullet headlights. Again, this was the last year for the bullet headlights. We have the uh, cormorant on this. Again, this didn't function uh, for the radiator. You would actually lift the radiator cap to put antifreeze in it. The grill guard, we see uh, this was the first year for Packard to put these vents in here that would help uh, cool the engine. Um, it has the accessory fog lights on it. This car is just loaded. The accessory bumper guard, and we can see the red hexagons in here that Packard used so much. The cloisonne hubcaps. And we can see each one of these is a separate piece. The beauty ring, this is a separate piece from this. So it has all the deluxe, even the wheel ornaments are deluxe on it. These were accessories, the uh, side mounts. And interesting, these three bars were ornaments that not all 1940s had this. The later models had these. Uh, those were added on uh, the, the later models. We see they still kept the running boards, and those are accented lovely. Then we come around to the luggage rack, which was an accessory. The 
license plate would go up here so it wasn't in the way the license plate light. Uh, this bumper guard actually folds down so that way you can let down the luggage rack. We have more bumper guards here. This was an accessory backup light. And then we can also see the accessory exhaust deflector with the jewels in it. Look at that. And even the gas cap has the uh, Packard motif to it. And you would lift this cover up and it locks, so you'd put the key in there. This dashboard, even though it's a later model, is again a work of art. You can see in the dash ivory-like instruments there. Uh, this car is equipped with overdrive, so we could see the overdrive jewel there. And of course, the radio with the radio antenna. This is actually uh, an original car. It's unrestored and you can see how well it's held up. There are no moth holes in, in any of the seats. There's no uh, scratches. The chrome isn't pitted or anything. And that just shows you the, the quality of Packard workmanship, how a beautiful car like this. Uh, this is one of their longer wheelbase cars. Uh, this is uh, they, they almost like a limousine. It's a 134 inch wheelbase. Um, they have uh, fold out foot rest for passengers, and it's just a great piece of workmanship. So I want to thank you all today for allowing me to talk about my one of my passions with Packers. Well, thank you, any Ken. Questions? Yeah, and we'll be able to field any questions from you also while you're here. And um, I just like to to say, Chuck, that we have a book for you, our traditional book that we present to all our speakers here. And uh, it's the Gilmore Car Museum, Miles from Ordinary. So we're happy to present that to you as, as our gift. Thank you. And uh, thanks Thank so you. much, Chuck. Thank and you. we're going to try to find out right now if we have questions from people out there on Facebook. And uh, the boss is checking. And uh, well, why don't we walk back in and we'll have sound and some light so that uh, people can hear what your, uh, your response is and we'll be able to also hear the questions. So we'll go back into the heritage room here and see if we have questions from our audience and uh, we'll see if we can uh, engage people at this point. <clears throat> Um, while we're wa go ahead. What was the last year for Packard production? The last year for a Packard automobile that would say Packard on it was 1958. Um, Packard moved their facility from Detroit to the Studebaker plant in South Bend uh, around 1954. And uh, Studebaker continued to produce cars into the early 60s. But as far as Packard, just saying Packard on the car, it was 1958. Okay, um, where was uh, Packard's production factory? Packard started in Warren, Ohio in 1899, and eventually what happened was, and this is through changes of management after the Packard brothers started the company, around 1905 they moved to Detroit. Michigan, and eventually built the largest factory in the world there. Part of that is still there, and it was a state-of-the-art factory. And um, a designer whose last name was uh, Kuhn uh, designed that. And uh, they continued to make cars there until like around 1954, and then uh, moved to South Bend until they stopped making cars. We got a question here from Ken. Um, and he's asking about the final days of production and the, the Packard Hawk. Do you know about that car? Can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, the, they didn't make very many Packard Hawks. I believe they only made uh, 625. And uh, that's different than the Studebaker Golden Hawk. Um, the 
back end might be a little bit similar, um, but 1958 was the last year. And what Packard and Studebaker was doing was they were um, using uh, each other's parts. Sometimes it's referred to as the Packard Baker. And so the last days of those two companies, they were actually using what parts they could to complete those cars. Uh, we have a lot of comments. It's fun to watch the feed right here on the cell phone. Uh, a lot of people saying thank you so much for your for your lecture today, the great pictures. We're getting a lot of response from our members here popping up. It's so nice for you to do this. Thank you for continuing with the lectures. So that's always nice to hear. Um, I have a question about the um, our earliest Packard in our collection. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Uh, the question is about what is the earliest uh, Packard that we have in our collection, which is a 1905 um, Packard uh, M model. Correct, yeah. Um, for the exhibit, and that, that was a, a car that was uh, purchased by Donald Gilmore. We've had in the collection since 1963. Wonderful. And that will be in the exhibit. And then there's also a 1901 Model C Okay. which is the fourth oldest Packard known to exist and the oldest that's still in private hands that we have um, uh, displayed for the upcoming exhibit. Wonderful. And, and that's, the, that's the beauty of this museum. Uh, I came in a little bit early so I could prepare for this presentation. And this, the feature mark for the museum over the course of the next several months is going to be Packard and the building where we're at. And many of these cars I had never seen before. And uh, as Chris mentioned, that is one of them. And that's what's so cool about this museum is the displays are always changing and always bringing things like that in. So, thank you. We got a question here from uh, Ken about the uh, comment about the Packard that was created in the 1980s for celebrities. Do you know anything about that? I think he might be referring to. The, the Packard Automobile Company name is, is uh, still owned by somebody. The Packard Club owns the trade name Packard. And uh, I market Packard watches, wrist watches, and pocket watches through the club magazine. And they allow me the opportunity to use that name. The Packard Automobile Company name, somebody purchased years ago, and they produced, uh, I've only seen one of them. It was uh, on sale at RM's auction a while back. And yes, it is a modern car. Um, they integrated the, the uh, Packard grill into it, and like the fenders that resemble kind of from the Clipper era. Outside of that, you know, it, they're right, it is a modern car. They did things as far as on the inside, like the steering wheel with um, trying to modernize what would have been a Packard, uh, like steering wheel uh, and other knobs into the 1980s. So I, I've seen the car, but uh, outside of that, I don't know of any of them out there. Getting, getting a lot of responses here on Facebook, people saying hi to Chris and talking about how they're excited about the Red Barn Spectacular coming up in the summer, and of course we'll probably be open by then, so that'll be great. I had a question that we discussed earlier before the lecture. Um, there's a YouTube video out there um, about Packard and the beauty of the engines and how the engines run so smoothly. And uh, would you want to mention that link for, yes. for folks so they can go and look at it sure. on YouTube? Yes. Um, Tom LaFair, who is a noted classic car dealer on the East Coast, if you Google Tom LaFair, and what he did, he posted on YouTube, I believe it's around a 1934 Packard with an engine running, and took a normal nickel on edge on the engine while the car was running and the nickel stood firm. And to prove that it wasn't a hoax, at the end he took the nickel and took it off the engine with his hand so it wasn't like it was glued on there. <laughs> but if you, if you Google YouTube 
um, Packard with nickel on engine running, uh, it should pop up. But, but that just shows you the workmanship. And I've heard guys that talk about their Packards where they were uh, running the car and they say, well, we thought the engine shut off, but it wasn't because it was so quiet and uh, just a remarkable engineering with the cars. And <clears throat> one thing that we're gonna do differently for this exhibit is we'll have a, a demonstration engine in here that we'll start periodically so people can hear the engine and, and balance that nickel on the super. Right. Are you able to see, let me see here. Uh, there was a question about the uh, comment about the final uh, days of Packard and the Packard Hawk. Okay. I think yeah. uh, um, kind of sadly, um, what happened not only with the Packard Hawk, but as well as Packards and Studebakers too in general, a friend of mine, his brother-in-law used to work at that plant in South Bend. Interesting, uh, the old part of South Bend, they actually had tunnels that went underneath the streets um, going to that plant. And I've talked to him a number of occasions, and when Studebaker went out of business, when they finally closed that plant up, those employees were instructed and ordered to demolish all the parts, all the books. He said they would break your heart. They would take hammers to carburetors, uh, tear apart engines. Uh, I don't know exactly why. And so I don't know if they were afraid of somebody stealing their workmanship or patents, but that's kind of the way it was in, in the later days. They were concentrating more on um, preserving what had been made and maybe they were afraid that some of that stuff would get in the wrong hands, but it was kind of the way it was back then. We got a comment from Chris Welborn, one of our great members here at the museum and one of our faithful lecture series attendees. And he wanted to thank you for mentioning Norm Knight out there. And that's Norm's old car. And Norm was a, um, had just passed away recently, one of our very well-known former executive directors here at the museum. And uh, Chris wanted me to mention also that Norm was known as Mr. Packard. So appreciate you uh, mentioning Norm today and in front of his car. Well, Norm was a remarkable man. Um, he actually knew one of the um, designers. Uh, Norm collected several Packard Dutch Darrens. Uh, Norm spent a lot of time in California during that time, and he actually became personal friends with Dutch Darren. And uh, you're right, just a remarkable, full of knowledge and I used to like to enjoy uh, talking with Norm. And this is the thing about car collecting and especially Packards. I remember a guy telling me several years ago after I purchased one, he said, well, what's gonna be your next one? I said, what do you mean? Well, Packard guys, they just don't stop at one car, you know? I said, oh, I got this 40 and stuff. Well, this was probably about three years before Norm passed away, he said, um, would you drive me to this uh, car, this auction? I can't remember exactly where it was. And I said, sure. Norm was probably about 90 at the time. And he was placing a bid on a 1940 Packard. Uh, he didn't get the car, but I thought that's, that's pretty doggone good. You know, he's still excited and was actually looking at purchasing that car um, back then. So yeah, remarkable. Right behind you um, is a beautiful car, uh, this long maroon low uh, car. Um, would you just say a few words about it for us, please? Sure. Um, this is one of my favorite cars at the museum. This is a 1930 Packard, and they refer to it as a Speedster. This is a custom body car. But Packard is the body maker. So this, this was produced in one of their custom body shops that they own. And the difference with this car and the other 1930 Packards is why they call it a Speedster is it sets low. So it gives a sporty, a, a sporty effect to it, okay? And the sleekness of it. 
and other things that were different with this particular car, they didn't make very many of them. Uh, the door handles were different. The different uh, running boards, um, things like this, the, the hood holders or the, the straps. Um, if we take a look at the lights, now other years and other Packards had these as well, but while we're here I thought I would point this out. Notice how they kept the yoke, as I keep referring to it, in the lights. The fender lights, the headlights, just remarkable. And we see the uh, sliding boy, as I referred to it. We see the uh, guard on the front of the radiator, the stone guard as an accessory. We see the, um, the uh, medallion there. That's the Packard coat of arms from their family. We see the uh, hexagon down there. Um, that's where you would put the crank in. And then these are interesting, these driving lights. These actually rotate as you turn the wheels. Rear option, the, the bumper, the, the bumper guards, and, uh, but it's the, you know, the sleekness of the car. They, they didn't make a lot of them, and what ones that they did all are characterized as had the largest engine at that time, so it could really get up and go. Uh, the other ones that they had, they had some convertibles, and uh, this is an extremely rare model. We see the, um, on the, uh, uh, by the door here, we see the spotlight, the accessory mm -hmm. spotlight. And Quite the workmanship, beautiful. very beautiful. Beautiful it's, lines. Yes, and even here we could see how it kind of kept that design, even with the tail light, uh, kind of unusual. This also has the double uh, wheels and tires on the back. And uh, the, the pinstriping, they had the, the uh, shades that would pull down on the sides in the back window for privacy. Did that one the two-tone paint and how they accented the bright color, the, the orangish red uh, with the maroon and the black fenders. Just very elegant, elegantly done. <clears throat> this car actually is is uh, part of our museum here, but it's owned by the Classic Car Club of America, one of our partner museums, and we're just so grateful to have it here for the display. Uh, Chuck, let's go look at the 08 around the corner here. This car, um, one of our uh, staff members and viewers today just called in the question. This is a beautiful car. This is a, a, a car that was purchased by Donald Gilmore in 1963. Um, mm -hmm. It's 19, is this the 08? Yep, Packard? it's a 1908 uh, Model 30 mm -hmm. um, that the, uh, the Donald and, and Genevieve purchased um, in 1963. It's, uh, it, it's been restored by uh, uh, Brad Janicek, who's a renowned restorer here in Michigan, in Marshall, Michigan and uh, recently came back from Amelia Island and had won the uh, Restoration of the Year Award. This is a, a car that has been um, you know, lovingly restored to, to every detail. It's, um, come back here and see this little jump seat. Mm -hmm. Nice. There's an interesting story that goes along with this. This was a uh, it was a big deal to be able to drive your car across continents and countries, and this car was driven across um, Russia in uh, 1908. And um, one of the stories is that it went 14,000 miles without any mechanical problems, but the guy that was traveling with the driver got stabbed by a pitchfork because it was the first time that a, one of the peasants had ever seen um, a moving car. Wow. <laughs> It's a gentleman's car built by gentlemen. Well, what's interesting is this was before the electric headlights, so these are run on gas. And you can see the gas hoses going up to light the headlights. One of um, the settling gas. Kind of the business model that Packard was following at the time was to focus on one model only and put all their energies and have that have the next model evolve out of the uh, the previous, 
So they were able to put a lot of energy and concentration on the very best successful automobile that could be produced versus a variety of different engines, a variety of different models that were uh, other manufacturers were doing at the time, and it gave them an advantage. It's also interesting to know this is right-hand drive. Yep, it's the last it's year that they... It was a right-hand drive, so... Yep. Yeah. Beautiful. We're getting a lot of comments, so thanking you, Chuck, and for being here, and uh, we'd like to say thank you again. Um, and this has been just a wonderful lecture. And again, appreciate you being here. And thanks to all of you out there listening. We appreciate you also. And we'll be um, looking forward to next Sunday and we'll move on with the lecture series. So. Great. And I'd again like to thank the museum and all uh, the you, listeners out there. You show your, yeah. the back here. Oh, yeah. We, show, we got it a couple times. I, okay. Yeah, Chuck's wearing a beautiful. Uh, uh, overalls, Packard, official Packard overalls. So thank you again, Chuck, and thank thanks you. everybody out there. And we'll see you next Sunday. Great. Thank you.